Hello everyone, I welcome you to today's webinar from SimScale regarding nonlinear materials uh, and especially plasticity. And I'm very happy that today we're joined by Lukas Schrotny from Enter FEA, um, who will together with, with us here at SimScale hold this uh, interesting uh, webinar regarding plasticity and he will um, yeah, help us really dig down into explanations how plasticity works, uh, when you should um, take it into account um, and how we should tackle it. And yeah, warm welcome uh, Lukas um, to this webinar today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> okay, I see we have already a lot of um, attendees, um, so let's get started. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe I, I quickly introduce myself and then we hand over to Lucas. Um, I'm uh, here at SimScale, uh, product manager and initially started as FEA um, developer um, with a background in applied mathematics and I am already here since quite some years at SimScale, <laughs> more than six years and yeah, currently I'm, I'm trying to, to support the simulation team um, with respect to um, yeah, deciding which uh, which features are the, are the next one we should tackle uh, and, and bring to the platform. Yeah, so my name is Lukas Stotne and I'm already intimidated by Richard because he knows something about applied mathematics, which yeah. I absolutely have no idea about. Uh, <laughs> my background is in shell stability. I guess that at some point someone didn't tell me that it's difficult and they forced me to actually do it. Uh, and yeah, I've been running my own company since I remember, so uh, it's over. Oh, over 10 years now and we are doing FEA and having fun and yeah I hope that you will fun as well today so we'll see how this goes. Great, thank you Lucas. I mean you know basically a, a lot more about all the details about FEA than I will probably ever know so. Uh, I wouldn't risk that but okay. <laughs> Okay, maybe um, not everyone uh, of our listeners have heard yet um, about SimScale, about the history, where we are, and maybe we, we can introduce uh, quickly uh, where we are, because uh, I guess you have also a lot of uh, followers and people who, who uh, yeah, are interested in, in your content. So, regarding SimScale, um, we were founded uh, already in 2012, um, based uh, out of Munich in Germany. Um, we have, meanwhile, already um, some offices um, in, in the US and in Boston and New York and we have developers uh, basically all over the, the globe. Meanwhile we, we, we grew quite a lot in the, in the recent years, um, roughly 80 employees and yeah same as, as the team, our, our user base grew and we have uh, meanwhile yeah, more than 150,000 um, users signed up on SimScale and yeah 300,000 simulation projects which uh, increase every day and this is about the company itself so what are we doing here at SimScale? So what SimScale is is uh, the first um, completely browser-based simulation tool right so with SimScale it was the first time possible to completely set up the whole simulation uh, from the CAD uh, directly on, on in a standard web browser you can um, mesh it online do all the pre-processing steps set up the simulation, run it uh, through cloud computing and also analyze the results through our integrated online post-processor. And there are very, various types of physics that can be solved uh, on the platform, um, started with um, fluid dynamics um, uh, based on finite volume methods, solid mechanics and also thermal modeling and recently we, we added some, some other components that enable um, some, some nice uh, transient analysis, um, for example, for, for city models and uh, urban, uh, urban engineers to yeah, uh, investigate the, the influence on, of uh, wind uh, in cities. And yeah, all of this is uh, accessible directly in the browser, there's, so there's no, no installation, your local hardware is not really significant anymore, uh, and you have access to your simulation uh, setups and results from anywhere in the world. This is what I think makes SimScale unique. And I'm handing over to you, Lucas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think that 
my company is slightly different than SimScale, and I definitely don't don't have the scale. Uh, we are just a small bunch of FEA nerds that do FEA, and we're in Poland, which is a beautiful country. If you haven't been here before, definitely come. It's super fun. And what we mainly do, we do design. And we design a lot of things in FEA. Basically, if, if this can be done, we'll definitely take a swing at it. But usually, since I have a strong base in stability, we end up doing uh, things in steel sector, and especially thin wall structures and things like that. And after a few years of experience, I started blogging. And uh, suddenly, my blog became popular. And I started doing training, and it's incredible how fast this goes, because I, I'm doing training only for like three years, and I already trained over a thousand people in FEA and engineering, and, and it's super great, even though still the, the main focus of our company is actually doing design, and, and training is just, you know, for fun. I, I was a university teacher for 10 years, and I kind of like teaching, so maybe this is what I substitute teaching at university with. So usually we do structural design, and we really enjoy that. We are doing FEA consulting and training. And But what I also try to show people is that FEA is really fun. It's not like a stupid black box that just, you know, spills colorful images that mean nothing to anybody. But uh, this, this is like a side thing. I hope to develop my business enough to, to act to focus more on this aspect and, and actually teach people how to do FEA worldwide because it's a great tool. I strongly believe in it. And yeah, there there is there are people who still don't don't trust it. And uh, I think this all comes down to skill. And I hope that you will gain some skill today to to use in your practice. Uh, so I will do the first part of today's webinar, and Richard will be doing the the second part, and then we'll do a Q and A. Uh, I divided my part into three things. So when we'll talk about nonlinear material, today this will be about plasticity. So firstly, I want to discuss issues you might have with linear material in general. So this, I hope, will show you that using nonlinear material actually makes sense, that this, this is something that will help you in design. And it definitely helps me, so uh, I hope you will agree at the end. And then. We will, of course, of course, discuss how nonlinear material works. Like, this is an important parameter, obviously. And I want to not only, like, I understand that uh, clicking in software is important, and Richard will definitely show you <laughs> how to set this. But, but also, you know, like the general understanding of what is going on, why it is going on, and what you should do. This is also uh, of importance. And also, when we go through this, there are, like FEA specific things that you simply need to know about nonlinear material. So this will be the third part of, of uh, what I will be talking about and then Richard will take over and show you how things are done in SimScale and at the end we'll have Q&A. So um, hopefully you can see somewhere uh, this small win vertical window of webinar. There is a chat and questions there. You can type your questions and at the end uh, when we'll go to the Q&A, we'll read those and, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll know at least some of the answers. So, the first part is the issues with linear material. I strongly think that many of you uh, try to solve something in FEA. And usually, uh, especially if you are dealing with steel or like metals and, and things like that, where the yield strength is actually defined and easy to understand, everybody understands that steel has a yield strength of some sort. Um, you most likely got out of linear analysis stresses that are higher than yield. And this is actually a problematic thing because you have a big model like this one here. And you can see that in those areas, stresses are way higher than, let's say, on average. However, we wish to define average, by the way. But, but there are a few places you can easily identify where the stress are much higher. And the question is, is the stress in yield that actually, you know, allowable? So, firstly, let's think uh, where the stress comes from. 
uh, as you most likely know, and I will be referencing steel a lot during this webinar, mostly because I think that if you studied something with engineering, most likely you saw this already, and you know this chart by heart, and it was on several subjects and at least a few exams, so you should be familiar with it. This is a stress strain curve, which means that the stress is vertical here and the strain is on the horizontal axis. And uh, you should be familiar with, with such a curve. This is a typical steel behavior, like if you have a typical normal ferritic steel, which is usually referred to as black steel. And you can easily see that this chart has two components to it. The first one is linear. This is what happens at the beginning. And then you have the rest. <laughs> Let's say that the rest is not linear for now. So when you are using linear FEA, you basically assume that the relation between strain and stress in your model is linear all the time. And at the beginning, it actually is so. You can easily see that the, this is a straight line, so the linear assumption is okay. But then if you actually reach a strain value, that is outside of the linear realm, so you know beyond this point, you can see that in reality, so with nonlinear material, the correct stress value would be here for this strain. But since we are assuming linear relationship, the stress is actually much higher. And this is how you can get stress higher than yield in your FEA. People usually say this is something like, you know, this is an FEA error or this is stupid or unrealistic. Well, in fact, it's only a con conclusion, an outcome of the assumptions you make at the beginning. You assume that you can calculate your model with a linear approach, and this assumption created two stresses. So obviously, you should use nonlinear material, but you know, like sometimes you you cannot or you you don't know how to do it, whatever. So the stresses higher than yield are actually natural. It's an outcome of using FEA to some degree. So the, the second question would be, okay, if, if that's the case, should we actually allow stresses higher than yield in our design? Like, we already said that this is natural, that this is not an, an error. It's just, you know, the assumption doesn't help. And the question is, okay, so if I get stresses higher than yield, then uh, can, can this be allowed? And in many cases, the answer is yes. The question is rather, you know, if you can allow them based on linear approach, and I will get to that later, but in general, uh, I even recently did a LinkedIn competition of sorts where I show the, the stress values from linear analysis and ask people how much this will actually take. And it seems that there are models you can have stresses way higher than yield that are still okay if you calculate them with nonlinear analysis. So yes, you can have stresses higher than yield. Of course, if you run into problems like fatigue, for instance, that this will be very problematic. So here I am talking rather about static design. So there are no vibrations, no fatigue, no things like that, because this complicates things greatly. But for, for typical projects, you could easily have stresses higher than yield in places. So the natural question is great, if I can have stresses higher than yield, then how high the stresses can be to make it okay? And this is where we enter the problem, because it depends. It depends on your model. It also depends on what you are calculating to some degree. And it's, there is no simple answer. I know there are books, very thick ones, that list that if you are this far away from such a detail or this far away from a well, you, the stresses that are allowed are stress time 2 or time 1.5 or whatever, right? And those usually are based in research. Uh, but I would rather base my estimates on nonlinear analysis, and this is why I want to share with you how I do this in, in actual design. Uh, so I never answer this question directly. I won't tell you, like, you know, twice yield strength is still okay. This is not the problem, and we'll, we'll discuss in a second how to do it instead. However, Let's just say that you found a book that shows perfectly that you are okay if you use stresses that are below twice yield, for whatever reason, and you believe in this book, right? This is not the end of the story. Because, you see, it also matters how big is the zone that yielded. It's not the same if you get 600 megapascals, for instance, that is above yield in one small point or on the entire cross-section. It's different but the value of the stress doesn't inform you. It just shows you, you know, the maximum value. And you need to also worry about how big zone is allowed. And this 
answer to this question is almost impossible to get in linear analysis. But let's just say, okay, for whatever reason, someone convinced you that you can have such a big area. Like, just say, how are you going to convince someone else about your results? Because, you know, there is, this is not like a really exact science, and by this I mean you can call me and say, look, I did an FEA, and I have stresses twice the yield, and my experience tells me that it's okay. And I can say, okay, but my experience say it's wrong. And then who's right? Like, there, there is no limitation. So when you talk with your customers or colleagues, it's actually hard to convince them that your design is okay based on the linear design where stresses are higher than yield. So, Instead, you can try to use nonlinear material, which greatly helps in all those areas I described. The first thing is, let's wonder how plasticity really works. So what will happen in your model? So firstly, obviously, we won't have one line. So it, it is not a linear model, as the name suggests. We'll have two. <laughs> so, so this is a bilinear model. And it's the simplest there is. Basically, we take the linear part. And then we assume that at certain value of stress, uh, strain increases, but stress is constant. So that would be a plastic plateau. You most likely heard the name. This is here on the chart. And of course, you can say, wait a minute, there's something else there. And it's true, but you, you rarely go there. Like the professors that taught me said that this is for like typical average engineers, this is for experts, and this is for people who are desperate. So uh, I guess there is something to it. And uh, the classical bilinear model, with, which often is called uh, elastic perfect plastic, look like this. And let's wonder for a second what it really does in your model. So imagine three guys that are trying to carry a rock, and it's a heavy rock. It's actually so heavy that two guys cannot carry them themselves. It's too heavy for them. The problem is that the third one in the middle is too short, and the short guy cannot help the other two. He's just too short. So in a linear analysis, you would get stresses higher than yield. By this, I mean uh, each of the tall guys who carry the rock actually gets more load that he can carry. So what plasticity means is that those guys can actually still carry the rock, but they can also you know, kneel a bit and go down lower. And the fact that they go lower doesn't help them carry more but it allows the middle guy to help as well. So plasticity doesn't strengthen any particular region. It just allows this to deform so regions nearby in your model can also carry stress. And this is what actually in reality happens with the stresses higher than yield. They don't disappear. They just quote unquote travel to nearby locations where the, the stress is actually carried. So the middle guy in the picture here. Of course, you know, stories about stones are fun, but let's try to do something a bit more serious. Imagine a simply supported beam, so you know, this is serious engineering, a simply supported beam. And when I uh, cut out the middle section, you can see a deformation state. It's of course slightly exaggerated, but let's go with that. And you can see compression at the top, tension at the bottom. So what happens is that it was a nice rectangle at the beginning and then the compression happened and this is shorter and tension happened and, and the bottom is longer. So we can say, okay, firstly, let's assume that we are in the linear part of strain, which means that we are somewhere here. Strain increases, stress increases. The higher the strain, the higher the stress. In bending, this would look like this. I have a certain strain distribution. It's always like this in bending. And then I have a certain stress distribution as well. But if I have strains that are higher, like you can see here, this uh, broken line shows the limit of strain that is still linear. And this strain here is al already in a nonlinear way. In a nonlinear way, which means that I am here and strain increases but stress remains constant. It's at yield stress. And this is how the stress distribution looks like. To the depth to which the strain is further than linear round, I get only yield. And then, of course, the rest is linear because part of the cross-section is elastic. And the more 
it bends, the bigger the strain gets, the deeper the yielding goes to the inside. And this is what happens. The deeper and deeper inside the cross-section material yields, allowing for more material to work. So it slightly strengthens the cross-section. And if you are using uh, beam models and you are calculating something with plastic section models, this is exactly what happens uh, in, uh, in your analysis. So let's now wonder what you should know about um, plastic material and plasticity to, to do FEA. Firstly, uh, I showed you a simple B linear elastic perfectly plastic model, which means there is no work hardening. This means that the second line is perfectly horizontal. For steel mm, material, this is, especially if you are using ferritic steel, uh, this is a very good model. And of course, at some point you will go up here, but you will actually limit the amount of strain you can have in your model, which we'll get to in a second, which basically means that you will have to shut off your analysis before you go beyond this point. And that's, uh, that's what, uh, what the model is about. Of course, you might be doing austenitic steels, for instance which de behave a bit differently and then the work hardening is actually visible and your bilinear material uh, won't be perfectly plastic. There will be work hardening. Uh, it's relatively simple to set and for at least for steels those materials models are very well recognized and usually the mm, modulus of the strengthening is around uh, 1 to 10 percent, so 10 times to 100 times lower than the typical young modulus of the same material. But of course, this depends on material. So uh, it's good to check that in a book. And what you do when you design it, uh, you should really worry about a few things. First of all, plastic strain. Go back to the metaphor with the guys in the rock. There is, on, there is a limit to how much you can go down before it's too much. And material has a certain capacity to deform plastically. And after this, this capacity is done, uh, you will actually uh, have uh, broken the material. And this would, should be divided into two parts. The first one is what's the physical strength. So for instance, Eurocode for normal steel say that to use a steel in construction, like a building, this steel should elongate at least 15% before it breaks. So, you know, like 15%, it's a number, right? But Eurocode also limit that if you're doing nonlinear FEA, you shouldn't really go beyond 5%, more or less, because it depends on, on the steel grade, but it's around 5% of plastic strain. So it's a limit. But plastic strain in itself is not enough. Um, because you should also think of, okay, uh, like how big area can yield in my model before I call it done? And this is something that we had a problem with when we did linear analysis. There is a zone which has stresses higher than yield, and how big this zone can really be in, in nonlinear analysis, the, the question still remains, right? Like, like you have a certain area that is yielded, and you need to decide if the area is too big or is it still acceptable. So here you can see a rigidly supported beam that yields first in your the supports and then in the middle and you can see that when you measure the displacement at the top uh, it still grows when you increase the load so this means that the model is quote unquote stable and in such a case the plastic strain will limit how much you can punish this beam however there are also situations like this one here where you can see that the zone here that yields actually starts to deform like crazy and does something can be referenced to as loses plastic stability, even though this is not technically correct because stability by default is elastic. But you can think about it as plastic collapse. Like the area of the yield got so big that the model became soft. A lot of the area could move without additional stress because this is exactly what plasticity means, that your material can move without increasing the load. And it actually it actually failed. So building a stability path that shows the deformation uh, on uh, uh, horizontal axis and load on vertical axis can show you that if the deformation increases while the load decreases, as you can see here, this is a failure. And this answers the question of how big area you can actually have that still yields in your model. And of course, this is not all. Like there are different models of nonlinear materials. Some are more weird, some are 
quite simple. Not everything gets to be described in a bilinear way, but I think that this step from linear to bilinear model is a huge one. And when you use it for some time, you simply get used to using nonlinear material, and then you will just read about additional materials that can be there, and you will be ready to to use them in uh, in your designs. And if you want, uh, I've made a course that teaches you some of the FEA tricks that you can learn from me. And if you haven't done it already, you can simply go to my website, which is enterfea.com slash scene and you can sign up for the course. You'll get it by email. So, of course, FEA is not only about linear or nonlinear material. There are things about loads, analysis type supports, and mesh that you should really know if you want to develop your skills in FEA. And if you're interested, just go there. I will be more than happy to, to teach you more of what I know. And that's about it. So now it's time for me to, to make Richard a presenter. And he will show you uh, how to do uh, things in Sims. Yeah, so now we, we, I think we have a very good um, understanding like how plasticity works um, in principle and when we can apply it and when we should be cautious um, and and where it, it really matters. So now I wanted to maybe have some, uh, also very simple example, but really how you put this uh, now into use in an actual uh, engineering uh, problem and how to solve this um, on some scale. So I made up a relatively simple case um, that I want to show you now how we can set it up at some scale. We have a standard um, I-beam of uh, the W section and that is supported um, with a fixed support on one end. Um, it is free, half a meter long and has some uh, pressure load on top, let's say 3 megapascal. And yeah, we have a, a we're assuming a, a bilinear um, elastoplastic material. Um, we have a standard Young's modulus of steel and we have a, a yield stress of this steel grade that we're assuming here to be 250 megapascal and the tangent modulus, which is yeah, a little less than 1% than of the Young's modulus, 1.45 gigapascal. Um, so what we're gonna, gonna see is basically, do we in this case need to, need to use a, a plastic material or is it fine if you just uh, run the analysis using a linear elastic material? Are there differences in the results and yeah, most importantly, how do we even set this up in some scale? So, for this, let me quickly switch to the platform. What um, what you see here is basically the SimScale interface. So this is, as you can see, also in the browser. Um, here is basically the CAD model of the sketch that we've seen now. So the iBeam and yeah, let's let's just start to to set up the simulation. So whenever we um, upload the geometry, the first step that we that we do is basically we create a simulation from it. So every simulation is based on a, on a geometry. And by the way, I mean in this case I uploaded a step file, but you can use any more or less all of the uh, um, commercial file formats that you know uh, uh, and upload it to SimScript, like SolidWorks, Autodesk, uh, and so on. So we create a simulation. Um, as you see, we have different uh, analysis types on SimScale available. Um, in case you're not sure really which one should be now the one that I that I need to use here, there's a there's a helper here. So let's uh, see what it does. So what kind of simulation do we need? Yeah, in this case, it's structural. Um, do we have heat? Um, no heat. And what are the conditions? Are we steady or low speed or high speed or even frequency uh, domain? So in this case, it's a low speed. And we see what is left is static analysis. And that is exactly the right one that we need to choose. Um, the, the one thing that we now um, see here is we, we can decide whether we want to have a nonlinear analysis uh, toggled or not. Uh, we'll do a nonlinear analysis. Um, even if we don't use plasticity, we might want to use a nonlinear geometry. Okay, and the workflow on SimScale is always um, always the same. So whenever you create a new simulation, uh, we define basically a template for you, and you can go from top to bottom, 
and basically everything that is green is already fully defined um, doesn't need attention um, the red dots basically uh, needs user interaction and there's sometimes blue icons where you uh, have the option to add something or not so in this case definitely what we need is material that's the first um, item so we're, we have a, a basic material library where you can select um, from specific materials in this case we use the standard steel that we have so and per default what we have here is a linear elastic uh, material so as we talk today about plasticity um, let's also check if we can set up a plastic material for this so as the, at the beginning everything will be red because we don't have um, um, all the properties there so first of all we set Young's modules 205 gigapascal uh, Poisson ratio standard and then the most important one here for plasticity is basically the stress strain curve so basically what you see here with the with the table button is we can define directly a stress strain curve right so we see we, we saw previously that the yield stress should be 250 megapascal so we put it in here the question is okay to at which strain does it happen so up to yield we know that uh, the material behaves linear elastic so up to there the uh, we use basically the Young's modulus that defines the relation between st uh, stress and strain right so if we divide um, the yield stress by the Young's modulus we end up with the um, uh, if we divide the yield stress we end up with the yield strain and this is what we put in here so in this case it's 0 0.00122 right um, 0 0.1 percent um, is the is the yield strain in this case and then we want to have a bilinear material and say okay we had um, um, a modulus a tangent modulus of 1.45 gigapascal so um, we basically need just one other data point uh, for the curve that shows us um, that gives us then in the end the uh, the second uh, the second line for the bilinear curve so we choose in this case um, just 0.1 uh, more in, in strain and add up then also 1% of the um, tangent uh, modulus and end up with 264.5 okay and that's it so in this case we have two data points that define our complete material behavior and uh, we're good to go right so until the 250 megapascal we have linear elastic and then from the yield point onwards we have uh, the tangent modulus and as we see we have basically extrapolated beyond this 1.1 percent we can see here right, right side extrapolation is linear so we basically have the, the same constant tangent modulus onwards there, I already see an interesting question here. Um, it's always um, the question whenever you set up a stress strain curve, what is it? Is it engineering stress strain or a true stress strain? So in this case, we use uh, a true stress strain curve, right? Um, I think we can maybe, if we have time later, um, discuss uh, the details and the differences between these two and when, they, when the difference is basically large and where it's basically negligible. Um, but in this case, um, as usual on SimScale, when you define a stress strain curve, uh, we use um, the true strain and true stress. Okay, so we have defined the material. Um, the next thing that we need to define is the boundary conditions, um, so the constraints and loads. When we add here a boundary condition, we see here uh, multiple options. We start with the fixed support. Uh, that we want to add on on one end on this side maybe which will fix all degrees of freedom right it makes it uh, supported and then on the top here we want to apply a, uh, a pressure so let's search the pressure load and yeah so what, what we're trying to do is not only have a loading but also tr um, have an unloading step so that later we can actually see the plastic deformation in the model uh, directly so we go not with a with a constant value but again with a, with a table we can also use a formula if you have an, an analytical expression maybe we can do, use this in this case a table would be easier so we set the parameter which is time 
at the beginning we have zero force uh, or pressure at one second we have I think we said three megapascal and after two seconds basically we uh, from one to two seconds we unload again all right so we have a increasing load and a decreasing load again so um, yeah we have everything defined and are good to go uh, one thing is yeah as I as you see I have already um, this is already in a, in a completed um, project so we have already a mesh here but you can also start a mesh from scratch um, with the new standard mesh that we have there's basically not much you need to change um, one thing that is um, important uh, in, in this case especially is whenever we deal with plasticity um, and also bending of relatively uh, thin, thin structures we want to use second order elements um, right because they are really um, needed in order to um, represent the stresses correctly um, for plastic materials and across the, the thicknesses of, of thin structures under bending. Right? As we always have uh, more or less a linear stress distribution across the thickness and obviously linear elements can only have a, a constant stress value uh, across the, the whole element so that won't give us um, the, the, the correct results. So we use second order elements. We can use some, some more advanced settings if we like. Um, so for example, we could say how many elements do we want to have um, as, as in, the, in, in the gaps. So to have at least, I don't know, two, three elements uh, across the thickness, right? So in this case, uh, we don't use it. We, we just set it as default and we're done. So we can either start the meshing separately or start with the simulation. Um, if we want, we can add refinements. So we might want to have some features treated uh, a little more accurately here and say, I don't know, uh, the, the radius here was, I think, five millimeters. So let's at least have whatever, two and a half millimeters um, edge length here. Um, and that's it, right? We defined the case, um, the setup is done and we're good to go. So we click start and the simulation is now running. Um, obviously this will take some time as we're dealing with a plastic model that leads to, uh, that is nonlinear and needs some iterations. Um, we also define quite some time steps so we don't um, watch now the screen and then the computing bar but rather have a look at the results that we already um, created. So maybe have a look at the results. So after the simulation is finished what we see is uh, we get an email, right? Because it's in the browser, you you don't need to stay on your desktop and, and watch it uh, run and, and finish. You can close it, do something else, and then you get notified via an email if your simulation is finished and you can go back and look at the results. So we get some um, number of iterations. So in this case, it's only two iterations per time step needed to see some convergence plots. Right, and then you also, I, what I also defined is um, just to have some comparison between the linear and nonlinear uh, model. Um, maybe let's, let's get back to this model here. We have result control. So if I have a special interest in a specific location or I want to see um, already define a, a table or a plot before I start a simulation, I can do that and, and automate a, a few um, post processing steps already. So for example, I want to have the, the maximum um, displacement maybe at the end of the beam, right? So I can directly um, compare it against um, the alternative analysis where I only run a linear elastic material. Um, or maybe I want to have the, the maximum plastic strain uh, in, my, in, my, um, in my body to see if I already um, reached uh, the plastic limit or not. Um, yeah, and so, so I can define a multiple of, of these items. I can pick specific points where I want to um, monitor my solution, um, all of these things. And then once the simulation is done, I will have directly uh, these results as plots and I don't have to um, separately do them in the post-processing. Right? So for example, in this case here, this is, it was an analysis with a linear elastic material. Um, as we can see here, it was linear elastic. Or we can then go to the displacement at the end and see um, 
here the, the vertical displacement is z so up to one second we increase it 3.3 um, .3 millimeters and we, in the unloading phase it goes back to exactly zero again so this and this is not surprising uh, because it's linear elastic all the, the strains are um, reversible and we go back to the initial state which was undeformed and now let's have a look at the the plastic analysis right so here I have finished analysis already with plastic material which had the same result controls defined and there we have a completely different uh, picture right so we see already that initially we see a steady uh, and linear increase in uh, in the displacement and suddenly we see a very very nonlinear um, increase in in the in the displacement right but there seems something to happen in, in the result so either if you would have a thinner structure there could maybe buckling occur um, or in this case we have like large plastic um, deformation and basically uh, a pure plastic deformation here in the end and then in when during the unloading phase we see that basically none of the deformation that we have had in the maximum uh, load uh, is um, regained afterwards so we, we stay with a, a very deformed model and if you look at the scale of the deformations previously we had 3.3 um, millimeters now we have 10 centimeters right this is order of magnitude higher than we had before and maybe we want to also have a look in the 3D uh, in the post processor maybe enlarge that okay so here we have our our beam All right let's go start from the beginning no no displacements no deformation and then uh, we set up an animation that we can actually see how it deforms and you see the mesh is relatively coarse so I just didn't didn't want to spend too much time now on the computation itself because it's just an educational example but we can see that it's there's a very sudden uh, increase in the um, in the deformation that we see here right and that is basically whenever we hit the critical limit on the area that uh, is plastified and the stability is lost and we are in a, in a very plastic deformation zone and then after after one second in the second part when we remove the load basically uh, the the deformation that we had before stays completely where it was um, yeah we have different results that we can um, have a look at in a post processor um, we have all the stresses we have the strains um, yeah maybe Farmese stresses um, scale to the the yield limit we see right that basically all of it is yielded. I mean, this wouldn't really happen in, in reality, but we, we at least know that we're way beyond the limit of, of this beam here that it can support, and we should consider, yeah, uh, dimensioning it differently. Okay, this is more or less everything that I wanted to show you directly on the platform. Um, we also want to have some time to answer questions because I see there are a lot already. Um, yeah, basically just to, to um, have a recap on the main results here, we see um, a huge difference in the deformations, in the, in the displacements, orders of magnitude uh, different than before, um, just um, between uh, linear and uh, uh, bilinear uh, elastoplastic material behavior, nothing else was changed. And yeah, here graphically we can see the, the sudden increase um, in, in the, the uh, displacement and the deform deformation and then um, the difference between between the linear elastic and the plastic deformation in the end okay this is this is it um, we don't stop yet um, because we have a lot of questions uh, to be answered we go from the top yeah you can also just pick uh, the ones that <laughs> that you like and leave the others for me uh, okay uh, so so Jeremy asks uh, in my example with the guys carrying the rock, uh, do you need nonlinear geometry for that to work? Um, no, you don't. Uh, you need nonlinear material and it will redistribute the stresses on its own. Even though uh, there was an example where I showed you that if a big uh, area yields, then the model can be unstable. To analyze that, you use nonlinear geometry. So 
in essence, you can do plastic redistribution without nonlinear geometry, obviously. This is why it's called uh, uh, mm, plastic redistribution. But to analyze your model, let's say, properly, and you know, according to Eurocode, let's say, there's obviously there are other codes. So then nonlinear geometry, at least at some point, will play a role to verify stability of your model. So uh, I would advise to use nonlinear material and nonlinear geometry, but for the example with the stone to work, nonlinear uh, geometry is not needed. Um, okay. There are some questions to seam scale, so I think that Richard yeah. will be much better at answering those. Okay. Uh, let me let me answer this already. So there, there Oh yeah, let, let's go. There were already some questions regarding the input and, and people find it, found it strange how the input was here. So, I mean, uh, every software essentially has its own way to define stress strain values and curves and input values. Um, some are used to, to tools where you put the, um, the plastic or the yield stress or the stresses versus the plastic strain. In this case, we're using the total strain, right? So. Um, the yield, limit, the yield stress will not be at uh, zero total strain. It will be at zero plastic strain. That's true. But um, the total strain will be, in this case, just the elastic strain that is uh, defined up to the, the yield limit, which, which is still basically exactly the border between the linear elastic and the plastic zone. And that's why uh, on SimScale you put in the, the total strain values versus the, the total stress, right? So um, in this case, I had to use um, basically the 0 0.00122 as the um, correct uh, referencing uh, strain for this yield stress value. And basically, the second input was then the one that I had uh, just used, uh, basically a random value uh, in on, on the curve um, afterwards that uh, starts with the uh, ten, uh, tangent modulus. And yeah, so that's why uh, I used this value here. So. I mean, correct me if the if the values if if I I, may, I might have done a mistake in the math. That that's always possible. So uh, the question is, could you give me some examples of geometric nonlinearity? Oh, yeah, that's that's an awesome that's an awesome question. Uh, geometric nonlinearity comes in many shapes and forms. Uh, you can have basically the two most common things would be buckling. So you know, if you compress something it will bend to, to the direction uh, perpendicular to the compression itself. And there is a membrane state. Uh, membrane state is something that happens uh, if you, for instance, build a castle for your kids using two chairs and a blanket, and the blanket is on the top as a roof. Uh, if you would throw a pillow on the blanket, the blanket will fall inside, obviously, because there is no structure underneath. But both chairs will go to the inside as well. Uh, this is because the things that are very thin uh, under vertical load, they cannot carry it with bending because they basically have no section modulus or the section modulus is so low that it doesn't uh, play a role. Instead, they deflect like crazy and they generate a tensile force in them. And since, uh, since they are attached higher and the middle is lower, the tensile force in the membrane element uh, actually it has an eccentricity so on the t where the uh, where it is attached it's higher in the middle it's lower there is a certain difference of height between those two so the tensile force multiplied with this height gives you more or less the bending capacity of such a membrane state element this is why when you have a hanging uh, hanging uh, bridge made of ropes and, and planks uh, it will deform in the middle like crazy because there is nothing to, to carry the bending so it has to deform to carry it with tension and uh, that would be the best geometrical nonlinear example I can come up with on the spot like there are of course structural things but those are very difficult to describe when you don't see me when while I wave my hands great Lucas uh, um, the question is regarding some scale if you can do axisymmetric uh, nonlinear analysis with context etc um, currently not. So all the models that we're running on SimScale are 3D, full 3D models. So you can do um, a section model, right? If you want to do uh, axis symmetry, you could um, use a thin, very thin section model of maybe, I don't know, five degrees or less. 
and then use a cyclic symmetry condition on SimScale and then you can also use uh, non-linearities and, and contacts uh, with friction etc um, on SimScale but in general um, all the models we have so far are full 3D full 3D models okay so um... I will go with this one. Can you explain why negative slope of stress-strain curve means failure? Is it only true for displacement control or does it apply to force control as well? Well, I think you are referring to the example with the silo, the, the last one when I discussed how big area um, you can yield in your model. This, that was not a stress-strain curve. That was the deformation of the top of the model against the load that is applied. So the logic here is quite simple, and it's actually pretty well defined in Eurocode in 1993-1-6. Uh, this is the steel structures Eurocode. And it says there that if the stability path, so the, the, the chart showing the formation of the model on the horizontal axis and the load on the vertical, if this chart goes down, uh, this means basically that the deformations increases even though you are removing the load. So it's basically like a definition of failure. If you would think about it in the case of a building, like when I look up at the ceiling, if then someone on the office next floor would put a lot of stuff on their floor and it was too much and the floor, you know, fails and start falling down on my head, the fact that they start removing furniture while it's falling down wouldn't change a thing. They remove the load, but the deformation still increase. So this would be like the criterion of failure. One of many, of course, but, but a significant one. Okay, one question here regarding the material models that you can use in SimScale. So um, for structural analysis, you can use basically three material models, if, uh, as you might have seen uh, um, from the quick uh, platform presentation. So we have linear elastic, um, we have uh, elastoplastic, which are uh, which is ma mainly for, for steel and plastics and these kind of materials. And then for, for uh, rubber-like materials, we can use also hyperelastic uh, material models on some scale. Um, how would I know whether the stress concentration, if it is beyond yield, uh, in linear analysis comes from stress singularity or not? Uh, to some degree, you'll never know. <laughs> but, but obviously, like, stress singularity comes mostly when you have like a point load, so obviously you know that you've used a point load, right? And then there is a sh sharp inside corner and details like that. So obviously there are those beautiful flags, quote unquote, that, that concentrate stress and it's, it might be a stress singularity. But I would quite like rotate this question a bit because you see, the stress singularity is an issue in linear FEA. Sure, like if you do nonlinear material, this place will yield a bit more and maybe there will be like higher plastic strain, but usually it's acceptable anyway. But the problem is that even if it is a stress singularity, for instance, because you used a point load, right? It doesn't mean that you can simply ignore it. Like, sure, part of the stress in the stress singularity is artificial, right? Because it will basically converge to infinity. So, so obviously, like, you won't get infinite stress in that region. I completely agree. But it doesn't mean that everything is fine because part of the stress will actually be there. Like if you have a point load, which was like the perfect example, like this load causes local stress, sure. And of, there are many ways you can deal with this. I, I even have an article about it on my blog. and. Uh, you can try to look it up and you could, you know, model things uh, with area, do fillet radio, uh, ra radius so it's not a singularity and so on. But in the end, like, regardless if it's a singularity or not, the best approach by my account, and this is what I use, is use nonlinear material and see where this leads. And this is how I, this is how I would approach such a problem. So I wouldn't even wonder whether this is a stress singularity or not because Whatever the answer may be in your case, you still need to do something about it. Because even if this is a stress singularity, you cannot simply ignore the whole region and say everything is fine because this is a stress singularity. You still need to solve it somehow. So, uh, yeah, this is where I would leave that. Yeah, I agree here. I mean, what, maybe one thing to add is maybe if the, if the question originally was just how do I detect it, right? And then maybe there's, there's different measures how you can uh, then basically approximate 
the actual stresses when you have these kind of uh, singularities and, and have basically some, some modeling uh, for it, right? I mean, the, the standard answer is if you refine the mesh, right, and your, uh, yes. your stress converges to or diverges, goes to infinity, then it's very, very likely that you have this kind of uh, singularity, stress singularity, and you need to, as, as Lucas said, do something about it, uh, at least think, and then uh, there, there might come different options. That's, a very, that's a very good point, Richard, uh, and I agree. Even though, technically speaking, a lot of effort will go into making a mesh convergent. Like, you know, you need several meshes, smaller and smaller, and verify that. I think that sometimes uh, it's already without even checking if this converge or not converge, uh, active, uh, acting actively towards solving the, the problem uh, is more effective because you, you won't waste time make uh, the convergence. Like, it is important that if you have experience, sometimes it's actually faster just to assume that, you know, I have to deal with it anyway, so, so let's do nonlinear analysis or whatever. And this saves you time in, in actual work. Great. There was one question regarding the results that I've shown. Um, if the uh, if the loading is beyond yield, how come there are all deformations are removed uh, whenever I remove the, the load? Uh, this this is what we've seen here, right? I mean, the deformations are only removed for the elastic material, right? This elastic material doesn't have something like a yield point because it's yeah, it's purely elastic up to infinity, right? So you can have an basically infinite amount of uh, of strain here. Um, and whenever you, you remove the, the load again, it will go to zero again. So the, the yield stress is only there for the plastic material, um, and there it only acts, and then if you remove the load, you will see that you will have some residual stresses also left there, and some deformations. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, so then someone asks, uh, is, so, sorry, I'm not reading names, but uh, like there's so many questions, I try to read li read them all. Eh? <laughs> so, is it necessary to apply nonlinear analysis when I have to work after the yield condition, or uh, do I need to apply it in all situations? Well, yielding is one, and like obviously, if you use linear material and you are still within the linear realm truth is that if you use nonlinear material, literally nothing will change. Like it's the same model, right? Because you are moving on the first part of the curve that was linearly upward, and both models have this region the same. So if you, have a, if you are within yield and nothing yields in your model, then using nonlinear material changes nothing. I must confess this happens extremely rarely. Usually you have someone places that yield, uh, and but maybe you work in an industry that requires huge conservativeness of solutions, in, in which case that might be uh, what you are dealing with. However, uh, this also kind of comes to nonlinear geometry, which is the second big nonlinearity, and you can have failure with stresses lower than yield, like buckling can be like that, right? I, I assume that you saw House of Flying Daggers or other Kung Fu Chinese movie. And usually there's a scene when the fighters there uses those very long bamboo sticks and they fight with it, right? So if you take one of those long bamboo sticks and simply compress it, like the, the compressive resistance of bamboo as a material is literally not important because it's so long and so slender that it will bend in an arc and break way before it will reach yield, like if a bamboo can have a yield stress. So yes, it's good to analyze buckling as well, and the best way to analyze buckling is to do nonlinear non geometry in your analysis. So I would say that for yield, it's very easy to see, okay, I have stresses lower than yield, I don't need nonlinear material. But for buckling and stability, uh, nonlinear geometry is subtle. It's hard to see in your model, unless you, you did it for a few years and you know how to move around things, it's hard to see whether you actually need nonlinear geometry or not. So, so I would be careful with this. Okay, I think we have reached the end of our webinar. Uh, as sad as it is, because I, I see that almost everyone is still there. Uh, this is great. It, it validates that uh, the Q&A is really valuable here. So. Yeah, it said that we couldn't answer all the questions, and while I'm speaking, <laughs> there are more coming in. Yeah. But 
exactly. Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are out of time. And uh, there's maybe one question that we can still answer. There, there was a question if we can do more uh, webinars regarding materials, maybe uh, hyperelastic, viscoelastic, maybe some others. Um, I think, from my point of view, definitely, um, Lucas, if you're in, uh, we, we can have another um, session here. I think it, it was a great. Yeah, I mean, it, I was it was totally fun. So uh, I'm, I'm yeah, it, any new definitely. webinar with you. <laughs> well, we'll definitely have to discuss the topics. Great. Yes. So maybe we can make a poll or uh, some question. What what is um, uh, a topic that would be great uh, for you as a, yep. as a technical expert and maybe for for me just just showing how how you can set it up on some scale. That would be great. Sure, so, that, that would be fun. Uh, that would be fun. Also, uh, if you're interested in my free FEA course, there is a chat and I chatted to everybody the link to the course. So you can click it and sign up if you're interested. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Then, thank you, everyone. Um, as as uh, the webinar will be recorded, we can send around uh, the recording and everyone can watch it again and get also the, the, the links uh, mentioned. Um, yes. Thank you, Lucas. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, um, it was. It was really. Thank you for watching and for your time. Okay. Bye, guys. See you next time. Yeah. Take care.